I collect questions. Good questions, bad questions, provocative questions, questions that start great conversations, questions that probe important truths, questions that help or hinder progress. Above all, interesting questions, questions that do something or say something or make me think. I collect questions because they fascinate me. What are they? What do they do? What do we do with them? How do I ask questions? How do you ask questions? Is it different? Is it a difference that matters? I want to take you on a tour of my question collection today. Uh, that'll take us to some interesting questions some of my favourite and some of my least favourite questions. And it will give us an opportunity to answer some of the questions I've just asked, including perhaps the one that has brought some of you here today, what is a question? Uh, but before I get on to that, I want to talk about the newest question that I've added to my collection. What is your favourite question? So some of you will have had a look at the seats and seen that there are some cards. Most of the seats have these cards on them. Um, and one of the cards has this question printed on it. And there is a space. And that space is for you to write down at some point this evening your favorite question. Um, there's some boxes at the doors. And uh, if you do have a chance to write down your favorite question, Please leave the cards in the boxes at the doors. I'm going to collect them in and add all of those questions to my question collection, which I'm going to publish shortly on my website, philosophyofquestions.com. So you can come and visit the collection, have a look at other people's favorite questions, see if anyone's got the exact same favorite question as you. Actually, I'd be very surprised if anyone has the exact same favorite question as you. I've uh, been asking friends and family over the last couple of weeks this question. And uh, these are some of their answers. So you can see the range just from this small selection. And you can see that people actually answer the question quite differently. Some people have answered it immediately, as if it was literally the last thing they were thinking about, which I love. Uh, some people take a lot more time to answer the question. Some people can't answer it at all, at least not without further discussion and qualification and debate. Being a philosopher, obviously, I love that as well. It is kind of an ambiguous question, after all. Do I mean, what is your favorite question to ask, or your favorite question to be asked, or your favorite question that has been asked, your favorite question to study? If you do get a chance to write down your favorite question this evening and leave it in the box, then um, feel free to take any interpretation of the question that you like. Actually, feel free to write down what you're taking the question to mean, if you can fit that on the card. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to reading all of those. And I'm going to tell you what my favorite question is, too. Uh, but not yet. So I started collecting questions when I started studying them about 10 years ago. My PhD research was all about questions. Specifically, it was about the epistemology of questions. And if you've been to any of the talks in this series already, then you'll have heard epistemologists talking about epistemology. You might be an epistemologist yourself. You might have encountered epistemology out there in the wild somehow. Um, but for those who aren't familiar, epistemology is a, an area of philosophy that is chiefly concerned with the concept knowledge and a bunch of related ideas, information, understanding, belief, ignorance, truth. So epistemologists are interested in questions like, uh, what do we know? How do we know? What does it mean to know? What exactly is knowledge? What is ignorance? Is it a bad thing? Is knowing something different from believing it or understanding it? Who controls what we know and what we don't know? What do we have a right to know? As an epistemologist, I'm interested in questions as a way of coming to know and understand things, as a way of gathering information and uncovering truth. The epistemology of questions is about looking at questions as an epistemic practice, 
as a way, a thing that we do all the time in order to find things out, in order to learn, in order to understand, in order to connect with reality and with each other. That's actually a bit different from the way that questions have been studied in philosophy in the past. Actually, questions have hardly been studied by philosophers at all over the course of history. That is a fact that I still find pretty astonishing. Socrates, for example, there's your man. He forged more or less his entire reputation on the kind of persistent asking of uh, particularly challenging philosophical questions. Usually to all of his mates that were normally trying to go about their daily business or get drunk at the party. This uh, notoriously irritating way of asking questions became known as the Socratic method. And yet, as far as we know, Socrates himself never asked what a question is or what questions do. Much more recently, uh, some philosophers have started to ask these kinds of questions about questions. This is in the 20th century, and these were philosophers of language and logic. They came up with answers like this. A question is a property of propositions, that property which specifies what it is to be an exhaustive answer. I'll just say it again. A question is a property <laughs> of propositions, that property which specifies what it is to be an exhaustive answer. Okay, so I can confirm that this is an interesting answer. It's a useful answer. Uh, but it is also a complicated answer that takes a little bit of studying in the philosophy of language in order to fully understand. We're not going to do that today. The point that I want to make about this question, uh, this answer, is that it treats the question almost entirely as a purely linguistic entity. And that makes sense. It's uh, philosophers of language that are coming up with this answer. Um, they're interested in language as a feature of our world, and so they're interested in questions as a feature of our language rather than as a feature of our social and political acts and institutions. I think there's more to be said. I don't think that this provides a definitive answer to the question that we're asking. There's more to be said about what a question is. I'm interested in the thing that we do when we ask questions, uh, not uh, just the form of language that we use in order to do that thing. So the epistemology of questions is about looking at the way that we use questions to learn, to find things out, to understand each other. And for me, it's also about uh, figuring out how to do that better. So what does an epistemologist have to say about what a question is? Well, this is really where the question collection started. I was trying to figure out how what I was reading in the philosophy of language and logic connected up with the thing that I was interested in, the thing that we do when we ask a question. And I was uh, coming up short. So I guess it just made sense to go and collect some raw data. I started the collection by asking 100 people I know to uh, tell me the first, uh, write down the first 10 questions that came into their head. Uh, they range from, do you love me, to do you want cash back? They include gems like, am I getting uglier? Is a giraffe bigger than an elephant? How long does a pack of cheese last? Um, of the resulting 1,000 questions, uh, the only question that was repeated, and it was repeated four times, was how are you? The other 996 questions were unique. And those are the first 1,000 questions in the collection. I then added like the first 100 questions that came into my head, uh, the first 100 questions that I found in the philosophy books on my bookshelf, uh, the top 100 questions that were typed into Google that year, about 100 popular quiz show questions. And over the years, I've added many more questions that I've overheard in conversations that I've asked or that I've been asked, questions that I've seen in interviews or in, asked by journalists, questions in classrooms asked by students and by teachers. The question we're asking is essentially what unifies this diverse array? What justifies me putting all of these things together in a collection and calling it a collection of questions? What is the question? So I have got an answer to that question and I want to share it with you today and see what you think. 
And I came to that answer through a process of elimination uh, by thinking about what a question isn't, really, rather than what a question is. I arrived at that process through another um, piece of empirical data collection that I embarked upon when I started studying questions. That was an online survey, um, and uh, it's had just over 6,000 responses up to this point. So the survey takes about 12 minutes to complete. It's available on uh, the website, philosophyofquestions.com, and I'd encourage you, if you're interested, to go and take the survey. I'd be fascinated to know uh, what you think. But for now, I just want to give you a sense of how I arrived at the answer that I arrived at to the question that we're asking. So I want to run through, if you're willing, three of the scenarios that are presented in the survey just now um, and uh, get you to respond. Essentially, what I'm going to do is read the scenarios, which are based around the uh, life of a school teacher called Sarah. They're meant to test our everyday intuitions about what questions are in a variety of familiar settings. So I'll read out the scenario, and then I'll ask you if you think that there's a question in the scenario. If you think there is a question in the scenario, just raise your hand. OK, ready. So <clears throat> one of Sarah's colleagues is discussing with fellow teachers a lesson he's just given on countries of the world. During the discussion, Sarah realizes that she doesn't know how many countries there are. Interested, she know. She interjects, saying, how many countries are there? Her colleagues respond with several different figures. So in this scenario, was there a question? Just raise your hand if you think there was. Yeah. Well, it's kind of hard to tell from this angle, but it looks like almost everyone has got their hand up. Not everyone. And that roughly corresponds with the survey results, right? So of the 6,000 people that have so far participated, 95% say yes, there's a question in this case. 3% say no, and 2% are unsure. I think that's fairly reasonable. It seems like a, at least a fairly clear-cut case of question asking. Um, I'm, I'm actually intrigued by yeah, the 3% who, who say no, there isn't a question in this case. But even with this vast majority, uh, we're still learning something interesting about questions from this case. So Sarah doesn't actually get a determinate answer to her question, right? She gets uh, several different figures from her colleagues. And yet most of us judge her to have asked a question, which means that uh, we don't need a question to have a determinate answer or to be given a determinate answer in order to uh, identify it as a question. And I think that's an interesting thing that we learn about our intuitive understanding of questions from this case. OK, so second case. Sarah returns to her classroom and remembers that she's promised a friend who will be visiting that she'll find out where the nearest butchers to her house is. Being a vegetarian, she's got no interest in this herself. But nevertheless, she types local Edinburgh butchers into Google and notes down the information. In this scenario, was there a question? Yeah, it looks like still the majority, but not everyone, for sure, which, yeah, more or less, I mean, it'd be nice to know the exact figures, but uh, more or less, it looked to me like that agreed with the survey results. 72% think yes, there's a question in this case. 21% think no, and the remaining 7% are unsure. Uh, so it tells us certainly that the case is uh, somewhat more contentious than the last one. But 72% is still a fairly sizable majority. And I think that tells us another interesting thing about our intuitive, or most of our intuitive understanding of questions. Because, obviously, we can tell, just like most of us, Sarah doesn't use an interrogative when she's searching in Google. She doesn't type her search in the form, standard form of a linguistic form of a question in English. She types local Edinburgh butchers. And yet, most of us judge her to have asked a question, which means that for most of us, uh, we don't need a standard linguistic form in order to be able to identify a question. OK, so third and final scenario. 
Sarah is trying a new ho route ho home from work. Along the route, she comes to the side of a busy, unfamiliar road with no pedestrian crossing. She looks both up and down the road before crossing to check if there are any vehicles coming and then proceeds to cross safely. In this scenario, was there a question? Just raise your hand if you think there was. Okay, yeah, that looked, that looked kind of similar to me to the last, the last case. Certainly looks like over half. Um, and the survey results agree, 66%, two thirds of the survey participants say yes, there's a question in this case. 28% say no, and the remaining 6% were unsure. So we can see that the intuitions are uh, even more contentious in this case than the last one. 66% is still a reasonable majority. And I think that tells us a third interesting thing about our intuitive understanding of questions. Uh, because, of course, Sarah doesn't use any kind of linguistic expression at all. She doesn't use words in any way. She's performing a familiar non-linguistic act, looking up and down the road. And uh, yet the majority uh, judge her to have asked a question. So that seems to suggest that for most of us, a question doesn't have to have any kind of expression in words. So what do we learn from these three scenarios? Well, it looks like a question isn't defined by the need for a determinate answer. A question is not defined by a standard linguistic form. And a question is not defined by its expression in words, at least for uh, a majority. Many of you will have noticed, some of you will have probably been frustrated by the fact that I'm not using any question marks in the slides. Um, and I don't use any question marks in the survey either, and yet uh, a lot of people are still willing to uh, identify and judge that there are questions in the scenarios. So I think that tells us a fourth thing, that a question is not defined by the use of a question mark. Question marks are certainly a useful grammatical symbol, but they're not what defines a question. So if we pull that together, I think we find out that our intuitive understanding of questions is highly permissive. We uh, judge a lot of things to be questions, perhaps more than we might have at first imagined. I think that's an interesting result. I think it accords with um, my own intuition and my own view about what a question is. And um, I think it supports what I was saying earlier about the analysis of questions that we find in the philosophy of language and logic. A question is more than a merely linguistic expression. Questions come from somewhere much deeper than the words and grammatical symbols that we ultimately use in order to express them. They start in the depths of our bodies. They start in our minds. A question is like reaching out into the world to discover. I think they start when we first reach out as infants and try to make sense of reality. The words that we end up with are vital for communicating this push, this reaching out. But uh, they're the top layer. And I don't think that we'll fully understand questions by focusing on the words alone. We need to look at the underlying process that leads us to those words, that leads us to ask this or that question. So uh, what is a question? First and foremost, I think a question is an act. It's something that we do in the world. If you buy this, if you take this approach, uh, if you think a question is first and foremost an act, then the next question follows quickly from it. Um, it leads us to a functional analysis. That is, rather than focusing on the form of a question, the linguistic form of a question, um, and so arriving at a formal analysis, we focus on the function of a question and we arrive at a functional analysis. In essence, we're answering the question, what is it that we do when we ask questions? Defining things like this is uh, familiar across different disciplines. Biologists, for example, typically define the heart in terms of its function for pumping blood around the body. And I think we should do the same with questions. We should 
define them in terms of their function. So the question is, what is their function? What do they do? What kind of an act is a question? I think it's an information eliciting act. I think a question is an act performed in order to elicit information. And actually, that's it. That's my relatively simple answer. A question is an act performed in order to elicit information. So there's plenty more to say, of course. We can pull that definition apart, even though it's relatively short. We can look at each of the terms. We can analyze them all. Um, there's a whole lot of work to be done, a whole, a whole thesis, a whole 10 years of work to be done. Um, and we can find counterexamples. That's the usual business of philosophy. And hopefully, we'll be able to do some of that um, in the Q&A later. But for now, I just want to leave the definition more or less as it is and go on to talk about some of the things that I think follow from this definition. There's just one thing worth sort of expanding on before we do that. I've said that a question is an act performed in order to elicit information. Uh, this doesn't mean that this is the only thing that we do with questions, right? We do lots of things with questions. We use questions to talk to each other, to communicate. We use questions to engage in conversation. We use questions to um, show that we care. We use questions to humiliate each other or intimidate each other or interrogate each other. We use questions to engage in polite conversation. And sometimes we use questions just to be heard. This is a protest sign, by the way, I believe. <clears throat> um, so that's what makes questions so fascinating. Questions are a powerful tool, partly because they are so versatile. Uh, but that's a metaphor worth dwelling on. A question is like a tool. In fact, perhaps it is a tool. And like tools, questions have a defining function. So a hammer, for example, has the function of hammering in nails. A wrench has the function of tightening and untightening screws. A pen has the function of writing. And we do use these tools for lots of other purposes. We might use it to prop open a door you know, or smash up a television, or practice twirling our drumsticks. Um, but when we come to identify them, we identify them by their defining functions. And I think the same is true of questions. We identify questions, and I think that the, the rest of the survey results bear this out, um, by their function for eliciting information. So a question is an act performed in order to elicit information. What now? What do we do with this? As philosophers, yeah, we take great joy in uh, painstakingly defining our terms, right? And I do think that's an important and often an undervalued task in philosophy uh, and in the wider world. But the academic discipline of philosophy doesn't always place enough emphasis on working out what follows from the definitions once uh, they have been defined. What do we do as a result? What does this, how impact does this have on the living of our lives? So I kind of want to talk about that, what exactly follows from this for our everyday lives. Most importantly, what does it tell us about how we should ask questions, about how to ask good questions and avoid bad ones? So I've got a lot to say about that, um, and not enough time to say it all. I actually run a consultancy where I work with businesses and organizations, helping them to develop effective questioning skills, improve questioning practices, and cultivate productive and positive questioning cultures, meaning the climate in which questions are and often aren't being asked. That consultancy work is rooted in my research in schools looking at student questioning in the classroom. Are there, any, are there any teachers or educators in the room? Yeah, cool. So you can confirm or deny <laughs> what I'm saying. Uh, but typically, I find that teachers and educators are very receptive to the idea that students should be asking their own questions and developing their own questioning skills and questioning traits, traits like curiosity, open-mindedness, inquisitiveness. Despite this, uh, we overwhelmingly focus on students' abilities to answer questions rather than to ask them. 
I often use an image just like this to represent what I'm talking about when I'm talking about student questioning. But one thing that you may not notice until I point it out is that this is almost definitely an image of a student answering a teacher's question, right? It's not an image of a student asking their own question. And uh, students are not um, incentivized, they're not encouraged um, by the system, I think, to ask questions. We've actually got good empirical evidence that tells us that students ask remarkably few questions in school, even when teachers value student questioning highly. We don't ass assess students on their questions, and so we don't incentivize them to ask their own questions, and we make it difficult for teachers to encourage them to do so, especially for the summative assessments, the important ones that determine grades and ultimately opportunities. There aren't a lot of tools and resources out there for teachers, and uh, somehow assumed that questioning is just something that students and all of us can do, because we do all do it. We do it from a young age. But uh, we also want to do it well, and somehow that is something that seems to slip through the net. We don't um, always cultivate skill when it comes to questioning. If we want to do this, it's probably helpful to have tools and resources and techniques for the teachers in the room. There's a great organization in the States called the Right Question Institute. They've developed a really interesting resource helping teachers to encourage students to ask their own questions. And as I said, I've also developed some of my own techniques and resources for, for, for teachers and for businesses and other organizations. And those tools and resources are based, in the first instance, on my answer to this question, what is a question? Because I think that in order to understand uh, how to ask good questions, we need to, or at least it's helpful to understand the answer to this question. It's an answer that I believe can help us. Incidentally, this uh, type of question is actually one of my favorite types of questions. It's the what is X question. Uh, these are the kind of staple of philosophy in my mind. They're the bread and butter of the discipline, right? These are the questions that Socrates was annoying all of his friends with, like what is love, what is justice, what is friendship? Come on, Socrates, just chill out and have a drink, man. <laughs> so what do we learn about how to ask good questions from knowing what they are? Well, I said that I favoured a functional explanation, a functional analysis of questions. This functional analysis tells us what we're doing when we ask questions. We're trying to find things out. We're trying to elicit information. If that's right, then good questions are questions that do this well. Questions that do a good job of eliciting information. Just like tools, a hammer is a good hammer if it does a good job of hammering in nails. Tools like questions have users. If I employ someone to put up shelves for me, I'm not just interested in whether they've got good tools, I'm interested in whether they can use the tools well. And the same is true of questions. We're interested in how to ask good questions, then we're interested in uh, how to be a good questioner and what it takes. I think we can get an answer to that question from the definition that I've been giving today. If a question is an act performed in order to elicit information, then a good questioner is someone who competently elicits worthwhile information. So as with the definition of questions, this definition of a good questioner deserves much further scrutiny under the philosophical lens. What exactly do I mean by competently, for example? What do I mean by worthwhile? A lot of the work that I've done developing uh, resources for good questioning comes from unpacking precisely these terms. I can't do all of that unpacking today, although, again, perhaps we can do some of that work in the Q&A. I can share with you a general rule of thumb that I've arrived at through um, the work that I've done unpacking this definition. And that's this. Ask questions to which you genuinely need or want to know the answer and to which the answer is worth knowing. And you'll notice that this rule of thumb is really two rules. It's 
at least it's got two distinct parts. And I think it will be useful to quickly look at those two parts separately in order to uh, provide some substance to the rule. So take the first part, ask questions to which you genuinely need or want to know the answer. I think this is good advice, even when it's not obvious to you that you're following the second part of the rule. In other words, when it's not obvious to you that the answer that you want is worth knowing. Um, so philosophy talks uh, often come with a good amount of time dedicated to the Q&A. This is an image taken from a previous talk in this series delivered by Professor Sandy Goldberg. Maybe some of you were there. Um, Sandy is a kind of a colleague and a professional hero of mine, so I hope he doesn't mind me using this slide. Um, but professional philosophy, despite the fact that it dedicates plenty of time to the Q&A period, um, doesn't train philosophers explicitly in question asking. Despite the fact that question asking is, in my view, essential to good philosophy. So I have been asked on uh, many occasions by professional philosophers if I've got anything to say about how to ask questions in the Q&A after a philosophy talk like this. And this is the exact advice that I've tended to give. Ask questions to which you genuinely need or want to know the answer. Probably the emphasis in this context is going to be more on want than need. And in other contexts, it would be the other way around. Um, but I do think this is good advice for three reasons. Firstly, it's a good way of signaling interest. It's a good way of telling someone that something particular that they've said is of interest. It might be because it's surprising or novel. It might be because it's contentious or problematic. Maybe it hasn't been fully fleshed out. But at any rate, it's a, it's a useful thing to do. It's a constructive thing to do, both in philosophy, but also, I think, in conversation in general. Secondly, asking uh, a question that you genuinely do want to know the answer to is a way of honestly engaging with someone. I think it's a form of respect. It shows that you've heard what they've said and that you're joining them in the project of trying to figure something out. Thirdly, if you do genuinely need or want to know the answer to a question, then I think there's also a good chance that you have identified an answer that's worth knowing. So you are following the second part of the rule of thumb. It doesn't make much sense to me if we were wired to seek out trivial or insignificant or irrelevant truths. I think our natural curiosity is uh, wired to pick out worthwhile information. So that means you probably are following the second part of the rule, even if you, if you don't know it. Ask questions to which you genuinely need or want to know the answer. OK, so take the second part of the rule. Ask questions to which the answer is worth knowing. That's perhaps a more difficult part of the rule. Uh, how do we know what is worth knowing before we even ask, right? Um, and actually, I think a lot of the effort in asking good questions is in doing precisely this. It's in figuring out whether the thing that we need or want to know is really going to be worth knowing, at least in principle. So when I say ask questions to which the answer is worth knowing, that's really what I mean. Spend time making sure that the questions you're asking target information that actually matters to you. And again, I think that is good advice for at least three reasons. Firstly, by doing this, we're much less likely to waste time searching for information that we don't actually need or want. Does anyone here have a job that involves a lot of meetings? Yes, lots of nods, right? So you can maybe relate to the situation where you're going through a meeting, maybe halfway through a meeting, maybe at the end of a meeting, and someone kind of raises the possibility that you're not really talking about the right thing, that you haven't articulated the problem. Well, not you personally, but the group, um, or that, uh, or that you, no one has really understood the challenge that is being discussed. Perhaps they suggest that you're asking the wrong questions. Actually, I probably this doesn't even happen nearly enough. We probably get through multiple iterations of these discussions and meetings before anything like that gets flagged up. Um, if it ever does. But spending time at the start of that process, uh, trying to figure out whether the thing that you're seeking is actually the thing that you need, is actually the thing that's worth knowing, it can save a lot of time and frustration. Secondly, going through this process 
is a useful way to refine the search for information. It just forces us to be more precise with our questions. A question that's too open or vague can cause havoc later down the line when the ambiguities are much harder to pass. So the process of checking that the thing that we need uh, or want to know is worth knowing, at least in principle, will often involve asking a series of increasingly refined questions. I've guided people through that process, um, and it is often very illuminating. Thirdly, checking that the thing that we need or want to know is worth knowing is a way of finding out what it is that actually does matter to us, what it is that we actually care about in a particular situation. So I'm going to talk about that care a little bit more in a moment. Ask questions to which the answer is worth knowing. So this is the rule of thumb. It is a rule of thumb. So of course it's open to counterexample. It's not going to work for all questioners in all contexts. And notice also that this rule is sometimes going to indicate that we shouldn't ask a question at all. In this way, it can also tell us something about avoiding bad questions, especially if you put it in the negative. Here's the rule of thumb for bad questions. Don't ask insincere questions or those to which the answer is not worth knowing. The reasons for following that rule are essentially the same as the reasons for following the previous rule. Asking bad questions can be a waste of time and effort. They can be disrespectful, even unintentionally, and they fail to get the information that we actually need. They fail to identify what really matters. As I said, I've got a lot more to say about all of this. I've got a lot more to say about how to ask good questions, about how to avoid asking bad questions, about questioning cultures, questioning attitudes, questioning climate, questioning styles. If you are interested in any of that, do feel free to get in touch uh, via the consultancy. But I want to make sure that we do have plenty of time for the all-important Q&A and for your questions. So I'll bring this uh, mini tour of the question collection to a close very shortly. Here's just a quick reminder of some of the questions that we have visited on the tour. And of course, what is your favorite question? Do remember, if you can, to write your favorite question down. Have a think about it. Write it down on the cards. Leave them in the boxes. It's completely anonymous. You, know, you don't have to be held to account. Um, I'm really excited to read them and add them to the question collection. In fact, would anyone be willing to share their favorite question with the room? <laughs> It's a very private affair, yeah. <laughs> That's fine. It's also, I think, yeah, one of the best. Why? Yeah, yeah. It's a good, a good classic philosophical question. Nice, thank you. Well, I said that I would tell you what my favorite question is, too. It's this. Why did you start thinking about questions? I love this question because it makes me feel like a superhero. <laughs> Someone wants to hear my origin story. It makes me feel like I should give Marvel a call and sign up to the Avengers or something. <laughs> so people have asked me this question or a variation of it a number of times over the past 10 years. I love the question, but I'll admit, um, I often give a more or less partial answer. And today I want to share with you a more complete answer. About 12 years ago, that's me, uh, I was seeing a counsellor on a regular basis. We'd been meeting every week for several months, and one day she asked me this question that just completely opened my eyes to an aspect of my situation. It was something that I hadn't seen or understood about myself and what I was going through. To be honest, I can't actually remember the question. I wish I could, uh, but it doesn't really matter. The thing that stuck with me far more than the question itself was the power that it had for revealing something to me. Without the need to talk about it, without the need to discuss it, without the need to search for an answer, that question just didn't seem to need an answer. That question was its own answer. And from that moment on, I became fascinated by the idea that a question could be its own answer. 
it seemed to me then, and it still does, that really exceptional questions have this quality. They so tightly capture what it is that we need or want to know and what is worth knowing that the search for an answer becomes redundant. You don't need to search for an answer to a question like that because you've already kind of discovered the answer by asking the question. I think of that um, experience of my origin story because it ignited a passion in me for questions. I don't know if that's a weird thing to have a passion about, but <laughs> reflecting on the experience of that question years later, I realised that it provided two key insights. Firstly, questions are a form of understanding. Asking a really good question is a sign that you've already understood something incredibly, incredibly well. Questions require us to take in all the information that's available and to identify the important information that's missing. It's like looking at a giant incomplete jigsaw puzzle and trying to identify the shapes and colours of all the missing pieces. Good questions require us to make judgments about which are the most important, which are the most valuable missing pieces of the puzzle. And that puzzle might be an idea, it might be a place, it might be a, a thing, it might be a person, it might be a challenge or a problem that we're facing in our educational, our professional or our personal lives. That's why I think uh, it's important to teach and assess questioning in schools and why questions are so valuable to businesses and other organisations. Because good questions are a form of understanding. Spending time trying to ask good questions is spending try time trying to understand something well. And secondly, questions are a form of care. I think the thing that was so striking to me about that moment with the counsellor was that by asking me that question, I saw how much she really understood my situation and the challenges that I was facing. She actually understood me in that moment. And that's incredibly precious. We all want to be understood. This was another person really trying to understand me, and that question allowed me to see that she did. It was incredibly powerful. I think it was a form of care. And we don't always notice this form of care in our lives. We don't always spend enough time trying to understand each other. But asking questions is one way to do that. Asking questions about another person, about their life, their circumstances, their passion. These are important signals that we understand each other or that we want to. They're important signals that we care about each other. The word uh, curiosity, it comes from the Latin verb cura, which means to care. So while questions are essentially information eliciting acts, Asking questions doesn't just allow us to find things out. It doesn't just allow us to understand things. It allows us to show that we care about an idea, about a thing, or indeed about a person. And I think that's ultimately why I'm so passionate about questions and why I think that we should spend time asking questions and trying to ask them well. That's why it matters to me. And it begins with this question, the question we've been focused on today, what is a question? Like all good philosophy, we end with exactly the same question we started with. So thank you.